Hello, good evening everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, episode of the webinar series Facing an Outbreak, Issues of Global Health, Ethics and Technology. Uh, this is the, the final episode of this series and uh, we are happy to host today as speakers uh, uh, some very, very, uh, very good uh, colleagues who are working all around in Europe and uh, who have worked uh, globally uh, in the past uh, to talk with us about uh, history, the past and the future. I mean, uh, the contribution history and future studies can bring to, uh, to understand or to better uh, um, to better know the situation we are facing at present. Uh, I think in this episode we are uh, considering the line of the time. What does it mean to look at the past, to, uh, to look at the, at the future and to better live or to better deal with the present. So I thank uh, um, First of all, our speakers, Rosa Salzberg, Massimo Rospoker, and Yashar Sagai. Uh, I wish to thank uh, now at the beginning uh, the, uh, Michele Nicoletti. Today, Michele is discussant uh, for the webinar. Uh, we co-organized uh, this uh, series of webinar with uh, him and with the Department of Humanities of the University of Trento. Um, our director, Marco Ventura, cannot be here today, but he uh, he says hello to everybody. He is happy uh, to, to know we are moving on. And um, now I wish to, to introduce the speakers and I will leave them the floor to, to open this uh, uh, reflection and discussion. So Massimo Rospoker is a colleague of the Bruno Kessler Foundation. He works as permanent researcher at the Italian German Historic, uh, Historical Center of the uh, Bruno Kessler Foundation. Massimo is an historian, a social and cultural historian, and uh, he works uh, especially on communication in urban public spaces. Uh, the project is currently principal investigator, regards is an era funded project, and it regards public renaissance, uh, urban cultures, uh, and public spaces uh, in early modern Europe uh, and between early modern Europe and the present. So thank you, Massimo, for joining us. Rosa Salzberg is an associate professor of Italian Renaissance history at the University of Warwick. She, um, her research topics uh, regard the history of communication, cities, mobility, and migration in nearly modern Venice and in Italy, more generally. Um, Rosa has extensively written. She, has, she is author of a fascinating book uh, whose title is Ephemeral City, Cheap Print and Urban Culture in Renaissance Venice. So thank you, Rosa, for joining us. Yashar Sagai is assistant professor at the Department of Philosophy at the University of Twente in Netherlands, and he is associate uh, senior scholar of the Millennium Project uh, on Global Future Studies and Research, that is a DC-based uh, think tank. Uh, Yashar uh, has been a uh, research scholar at the, at the Berman Institute of Bioethics at the John Hopkins University in Baltimore, and uh, previously has earned a PhD um, at Georgetown University, where we met many years ago. Uh, Yashar comes from, from France, where he studied the philosophy, history of philosophy and medical ethics, and uh, actually is working uh, on uh, global food ethics, uh, um, bioethics uh, for sites, uh, and uh, issues uh, regarding the, the anticipation of alternative uh, futures. That's uh, a, a, a specific field of the future studies uh, approach. 
So thank you, Yashar, for, for coming. Michele Nicoletti is a professor of political philosophy at the Department of Humanities of the University of Trento. Michele has worked and written extensively on uh, some main philosophers, on Kierkegaard, Karl Schmitt and his political theology. Uh, he has written a book on politics and the evil and has edited uh, books and uh, critical edition on main philosophers of the 19th and 20th century. Michele has, uh, has a specific interest in political philosophy, ethics, anthropologies, and political theology. That is one of his fields of, uh, of research. He has been visiting fellow in different and several international universities. And um, he has coordinated the national and international research projects. And in the last uh, years, uh, uh, after a mandate uh, as uh, president of the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, uh, has launched uh, an academic network uh, focusing on uh, human rights, uh, democracy and the rule of law. So many thanks to all of you. I, I see many different uh, points of uh, uh, confrontation and an uh, inter uh, section of interest uh, among uh, all of you, I think among all of us. So I leave the floor to Rosa, uh, who will let us uh, understand what does it mean to look at pandemics, uh, reading uh, uh, texts and uh, studying the history. Thank you so much, Rosa. The Thank, floor you. Thank you. Thank yeah, um, you. I'm just going to present my screen. Okay, please tell me if you can't see it. <laughs> okay, so thanks very much for the invitation. Um, so I, I wanted to just speak briefly about my research as a historian, looking a little bit at the history of pandemics and um, say something about what we can learn from looking backwards, I think. Um, I hope you can't hear that ringing on the computer. <laughs> So um, I'm a historian, as Lucia said, I'm a historian of early modern Italy, particularly of cities and communication and migration and uh, mobility more recently. So in the last few years, I've been, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, there we go. Okay, I apologize if you heard that phone call. So in the last few years, I've been looking particularly, um, studying the history of Venice uh, in the early modern or Renaissance period as a center of migration, travel and transit. Uh, looking particularly at where people stayed, how they interacted with locals, and how movement was controlled. And I'm going to explain in a minute how this links to the question of pandemics. But just to say briefly before that, and to re you know remind you of a bit of history, if it's not that familiar. So Venice in the early modern period was the capital of a vast empire which stretched from near Trento, uh, from the Alps, to the eastern Mediterranean, and a major entrepot of trade and transit between east and west. And it was also one of the largest cities in Europe at the time, which is important too. And this intense movement of people and of things made it uniquely vulnerable to the spread of disease, as, as was Italy more broadly. This was something that I started to think about a bit more seriously, a bit before the pandemic, actually. Uh, at the end of 2019, I was in Venice um, teaching for the University of Warwick, and I visited the Lazaretto Nuovo, which was the... Um, one of the two plague hospitals that Venice uh, built in the 15th century. It's the one on the top right-hand corner of this map. And uh, this, these hospitals were built in the aftermath of the Black Death as a way to try and prevent um, further contagion. And these, and I'll, I'll say a bit more in a minute that these are really pioneering responses to the, the continuous problem of plague in this period. Um, so the Lazaretto Vecchio, which you can see on the bottom right-hand corner uh, of the map, was the first to be built and it was a place to isolate and treat plague victims. But the Lazaretto Nuovo, which I visited for the first time in 2019, um, was used outside of epidemics also to quarantine ships, people, merchandise arriving from suspected places to try and stop contagion basically and this is just some images from the island of places that survived the big warehouses where they would disinfect all of the merchandise 
um, that they'd brought there and and then there was accommodation for people staying, you know, doing their quarantine period, basically. And uh, it's an extraordinary place to visit if you get the chance because there's also this wonderful graffiti from the 16th century which reminds us really of um, all of the different people and things coming through this place because it talks about, uh, it's, it's from people who are on the ships and people who worked in the Lazaretto talking about ships coming from Cyprus and other parts of Greece. Um, you can see an image of a ship on the right hand side. So um, I took my students there to try and teach them about the history of uh, plague and uh, no one turned up to let us in unfortunately uh, for, for a while. We had to wait for about an hour and while I was sort of standing in this rather desolate place, this is a view from the from the island looking out on the Venetian lagoon, it made me think about what happens when a city that relies on the movement of people and goods uh, comes to a grinding halt, which was something that happened a few times, but particularly in one of the key moments that I researched, which is in the 1570s, the mid 1570s, where in the space of two years, about a third of the population uh, died of plague and traffic stopped. So just to remind us of Venice, um, this is a famous image of the city in 1500, but all of these ships that would have been normally bringing all of these goods and people from all over the Mediterranean and beyond, um, you know, for this period of a couple of years when the city was facing the plague, uh, obviously that traffic stops and the only kind of movement through the lagoon would have been these little boats going back and forward to the Lazaretti, taking sick people to be isolated or eventually to die in many cases. So that was the background um, that led to a year ago or so, a bit more than a year ago in spring 2020, um, Massimo and I, uh, who's, Massimo is going to speak afterwards, were thinking of talking about these kind of parallels with, with the moment that we were living through and we decided to write a little article for the La, La Lettura supplement of the Corriere della Sera uh, about talking about this history. And we were struck really by some of the parallels with the moment we were living through, although, of course, there are very important differences. So, for example, that the Carnevale in Venice was cancelled last year as it was in 1575 and 6, that a lot of the shops closed. Half of the city in, in the 16th century for this two-year period were put into home quarantine to try and prevent spread. There was heightened suspicion and demonization of foreigners suspected of bringing the plague to Venice. And in fact, the patient zero of this particular outbreak was considered to be a man from Trento who came to the city. Um, but in other places, it was often Jews or gypsies who were accused of um, bringing the plague. Other parallels that struck us included the way that people chafed against the lockdown and constantly resisted it seeking relief from the boredom and also just simply needing to get out of their houses in order to earn a living or buy food or some of the things that we can now do more easily from home thanks to the internet. We we're also struck by the desperate search um, for all kinds of different remedies, uh, both by the government, the Venetian government, which was, you know, paying vast amounts of money in some cases to doctors and charlatans for kind of spurious um, remedies, um, but also the ordinary population clearly looking for answers and looking for protection. And just to give an example of this, this is a printed um, little tiny piece of printed paper with a prayer um, promising to protect the person who recites the prayer from the plague. And I found this in my earlier research on, on Venice that it was, uh, it was being sold on the streets in the middle of this epidemic by street peddlers for a very small sum. So this is kind of an example of the kind of answers that people were looking at, at the time. I've been increasingly struck also by the way that this kind of pervasive fear about the spread of disease really shaped so much about life at the time that it makes you as a historian look back on the period quite differently, I think, having now lived through a little bit of something similar. Um, so, for example, looking back on paintings like this one by Tintoretto, which is in the Scuola Grande di San Rocco in Venice, which depicts a, uh, a biblical scene, but considered to be about the act of healing and particularly about the treatment of plague, but it was painted in the middle of this pandemic uh, in the 1570s. And obviously it's got these pile of dead bodies and all of these things. So, you know, you look back at a painting like this, knowing it was painted that time in a, in a different way. Um, we were also struck by the, the struggle at the time to find a balance between protecting health 
by banning travel from infected cities, by banning trade, and the need to protect the economy and not choke it off by, by blocking movement. And also by um, the struggle between the, the need to cooperate with neighbouring states in order to share information if you wanted to stop contagion, and also the wish to compete to maybe hide uh, information if you know there was an outbreak in your state um, that you didn't want other people to know about or they would block off travel from your area, which is something that obviously there have been parallels with today. Um, so at the same time, personally, I found it quite comforting in the midst of this tumultuous time as we were writing this article, you know, March 2020, uh, to look more closely at this history and to realise um, firstly, how much obviously we have to be grateful for, whether it's because of the lower rates of mortality, much lower rates of mortality of coronavirus, because of the fact that we've managed to find a vaccine uh, so quickly and because of obviously the vastly superior healthcare that we can access now. But I also found it kind of comforting at a time when Italy felt um, like the worst place to be in Europe for a couple of months last year. Um, how important to discover really how important the Italian states had been in developing responses to plague and then that were then spread to the rest of Europe that were very influential. So just to say a little bit more about that. So I mentioned the Lazaretti, these plague hospitals, which Venice, Venice was the first to build one of these permanent plague hospitals in 1423. But Venice and other neighbouring states like uh, Milan and Ragusa, which is now Dubrovnik, also pioneered other responses to plague. So, for example, the invention of quarantine, uh, which was invented in, in Ragusa in the late 14th century, the invention of these kind of travel bans, blocking off, recognising that that was a way to stop contagion by stopping the movement of people and things. The establishment of permanent public health offices to try and prevent contagion and, and, and kind of improve the health of the city in a permanent way rather than just as a kind of ad hoc response to crises. Venice in particular was also uh, one of the places that pioneered the use of what a, we could, might call health passes or bollettini di sanità. So this is a kind of green pass almost, um, except it, it basically says that the carrier can travel because they, they come from a place that isn't infected with plague. So it, it allows a kind of balance between this need to move and on the other hand, um, the, the try and, trying to sort of prevent the spread of disease. These and some of the other technologies of prevention um, that were developed in the Italian and the kind of Adriatic Mediterranean states in this period um, really set the standard for centuries to come. So, for example, the Lazaretti, um, Venice then established Lazaretti throughout its maritime state throughout the 16th and 17th centuries and also on the mainland and they were also built in places like Milan and Livorno and other important trade centres. Um, and this was something that then spread to the rest of Europe. Um, but I should also say that this was a very slow process of trial and error over a couple of hundred years following the Black Death um, with some spectacular failures. So, for example, in 1575, once they kind of failed to act quickly enough, um, it was too late, really. And as I said, a third of the population died in two years. And again, in 1630, a similar thing happened in northern Italy. Um, but saying that, they were kind of the last major outbreaks in northern Italy. So bit by bit, people developed some techniques that worked. So briefly to just conclude, why do I think it's important to study and to be aware of this longer history when we face current and future outbreaks? Um, well, I mean, quite obviously, looking at past pandemics helps us to rise a bit above the fear of the moment and to put our own time in better perspective what we have to be grateful for, but also what we shouldn't take for granted, the risks that come from the, with, that come along with the great advantages and advances of contemporary life. And I think taking a long-term perspective is obviously really important rather than just acting, you know, uh, making conclusions in the moment. And, for example, I'm thinking of the work of the historian Guido Alfani who's written really important studies of the long-term economic impact of plague in Italy in particular. 
um, studying this kind of history, at least I feel, teaches us some, some kind of humility in the sense that we've still not moved past some of these methods of containment. We're all still talking about quarantine um, and travel bans and various things. Um, and we still fail to rise above the differences and to cooperate across borders, even when it would quite clearly help us in many ways. And we also make the same mistakes and fail to learn from them continuously. And I, I wanted to use this cartoon that my dad sent me last year, which is a bit depressing, but um, so it sums up something of that. But at the same time, I think um, I feel that studying this kind of history does give some cause for hope because having managed to obviously come up with a vaccine in such a short amount of time, distribute it, um, also in observing the way that disasters bring communities together and strengthen social bonds as well as disrupt them, you know, does tell us something about both the positive sides of these terrible moments, but also about the slow accretion of knowledge despite false steps. Um, and it reminds us how the battle with disease and the delicate relationship between humans and the environment is a perennial one, um, which has shaped so much about our cities and our heritage and the ways that we live. And I'm going to pass over at that point, uh, I think, to Massimo, who's going to say a bit more about um, space. So I will stop presenting. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. Okay. Now, please, <laughs> Massimo. Okay. Um, yeah, as I promised you, Lucia, I don't have a paper, so, um, but I decided to show you a kind of short version of a video which was actually produced during the pandemic. And at the end of the video, uh, I'll just try to give you a bit of context on when and why this video was uh, actually made. So if Isabella, se puoi lanciare il video, and well, we talk a little bit later. Public Renaissance is a project funded by the Humanities and European Research Area involving colleagues from universities in Italy, Germany, Spain, the Netherlands, as well as the UK. We're looking at five cities as our primary case studies, but expanding these outwards. They're Exeter, Valencia, Hamburg, Deventer and Trento. We're considering the public spaces that are at the heart of many of our European cities today and thinking about how these were shaped in the past during a period roughly from 1400 to 1650. We're interested above all in how public spaces were shaped by the everyday actions of individuals, as opposed to the top-down control of institutions and rulers, but of course they were shaped by both. We have a strong focus on material culture, the built environment, but also objects in museum collections. The material culture of public space has been quite often overlooked, like almost everyone, our work has of course been affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, but you can imagine that as a project that is focused on public space, it's particularly affected by not being able to access those spaces. The degree to which cities under lockdown reveal how vital to urban life is that word life. The moving bodies, crowds, pedestrian traffic, varying flows of movement, tourists and workers that animate the city itself. Seeing historic centres stripped of people and life somehow highlights how important the balance is between people and place in the urban ecosystem. As historians, we've also been struck by the analogies that resonate across the centuries and which we hope to share a little with you. In the short interviews that follow, the project teams present snapshots of their research on public renaissance, offering thoughts on resonant objects that speak to us across the centuries of how public space and epidemics intersect in ways that are often remarkably similar to how they function today. The research on the use of public space in Deventer is very much focused on the use of public space for the dissemination of knowledge, learning and, and contents. So the central idea is what could people actually learn from participating in activities taking place in, uh, in the public space. 
Another important point in the research is the relation between uh, public space and privacy. So on the one hand, the openness of the public space and the safety of the closed private space. So the tension is, I think, very interesting for understanding the present day situation, which is very, very indeed centered on the complex correlation between openness and, and closure. The object I've chosen to illustrate my point is a so-called book of hours, a prayer book. In this specific case, uh, a book of hours in the vernacular, so in uh, medieval Dutch language, as I call it in Middle Dutch. This text in the Middle Dutch was translated by uh, Gert Grote, the, the foreman of the modern devotion, probably the most famous uh, pre-modern Dutch religious movement. Spirituality and religion are I think essential in the discussion of the impact of pandemics. Uh, you escape, let's say, the open space and the open world and try to find yourself back into spirituality and, and religion. In some way, you could say that COVID-19 pandemics is all about space. It seems like health has become a matter of closing the door the outside world and of avoiding the public. So public is dangerous, privacy is safety. This is also what we notice in if we study indeed the impact of religious movements in Deventer during the late Middle Ages. Twente was an Italian city with a strong and very important German-speaking community. It was a border city between different cultures and languages, between Catholic and Protestant lands. It was also a getaway city for travellers between North and South of Europe, with many public houses, hotels and inns. It was finally a transit city along the water channel of the Adige River and the Alpine Brenner Pass. But precisely because of its geographic location, as many other Italian northern cities on international commercial and travel routes, Trento was also the front line of epidemics. Renaissance cities adopted, uh, we can say, innovative measures to control the spread of a disease. Their initiatives provided a model for the rest of Europe, with many key ideas still in use today. For instance, they created the first permanent plague hospitals, the so-called Lazaretti, which served as isolation hospitals or quarantine centers. And as a sort of striking analogy with the present, printed bandy were posted on walls and read aloud in the streets, carrying government degrees and advice on how to combat the disease. We've chosen this fascinating object, which is a devotional banner, visually representing the epidemic which affected the city in 1630, when at least one third of the population died. On the background, we observe a city behind hard walls. It is not an open city or a transit city anymore. We can imagine a city in a lockdown with empty public spaces where austere inns and public houses are forced to close. Preaching and church services have stopped. Doctors and women helping the patients come and go frenetically. Towels and sheets are washed in the river, some other are burnt. And then in a kind of extraordinary detail, we notice that large wine barrels are used as provisional beds for the patients to lay down. While in the sky, saints are pointing at the Lazaretto, praying the Virgin Mary for the salvation of the city. Well, this banner is an interesting reminder that while there are analogies between present and past, there are also many differences. In fact, if processions were a natural response to epidemic in the Renaissance, social distancing was not necessarily compatible with religious practices and public penitential rituals. It's difficult to draw straightforward parallels between today's COVID-19 outbreak and early modern plague visitations. Uh, one major difference is that back then, people in Western Europe were familiar with fatal epidemics. Bubonic plague is not the only contagious killer disease around, and Exeter suffered recurring outbreaks of sickness as it was amongst the largest cities in 16th century England. But the plague, as they called it, was out of the ordinary. It unpredictably killed more people more quickly, it stopped work, wiped out wealth, devastated households, all of which sound horribly familiar to us now. 
There was a kind of lockdown equivalent because they'd noticed that people and their goods moving around seemed to spread the disease. So in 1603, Exeter's city stewards emerged from the Guildhall and gave special warning that no one should admit into the city any people or goods from plague infected places. The city gates were guarded day and night, but despite also being encircled by high walls, the plague took hold. Once that happened, the national plague orders stated that infected households were to be completely shut up for at least six weeks, with everyone sick or healthy still inside. The main impact on public spaces focused on keeping people out of them. So, for example, the city council had to cancel the busy, crowded local fairs. However, the marketplaces seemed to be operating as this is where cancellations were publicised. The museum object I've chosen is this 16th century medicine jar made in France but excavated in Exeter. It perhaps stored treacle, not the modern sweet sticky cooking ingredient, but back then a famous remedy from classical times called a, a theriac or an antidote. And a chief ingredient was supposed to be viper's flesh, the theory being that its poison destroyed other poisons, including plague. It didn't, but maybe the opium in it felt like a cure. This jar has the words tout ira bien inscribed into it, which translates as all will be well. This 450 year old jar that perhaps contained the hope of a cure for plague has a particular resonance now, I think, as we urgently seek a COVID-19 vaccine, so all will be well for us too. In our project, we focus on public spaces of Hamburg, Germany, in mid-late 17th century. At the time, Hamburg was considered by contemporaries as the most greatly flourishing German city, and you can see a map of Hamburg right behind me at the time. This big city of about 75,000 inhabitants was rich and important, and it was well connected with international postal networks, and above all, it was a transit stop of many trade activities of the time. However, in times of pandemic, all this self-awareness changed rapidly. It was no longer a hotspot of trade flows, but the city became or changed quickly into periods of enforced slowness, of non-movement and of disconnecting from these trans-regional connections. The public spaces of the city, usually the places of social interaction, of merchant activity, into new spaces of seclusion, and all this allowed for altered perception of the material city. Temporary restrictions on production and distribution of news media changed the flows and patterns of rumors and information circulating through the social communities of Hamburg. Any restriction on this caused different behaviors fastly and encouraged altered perception of public spaces, of trust, of rumors, of reliable information in the city. The object I have chosen is this plaque regulation of 6064. As it was usual at the time, these orders were announced by so-called decrees. Free trade was closed down, quarantine placed. People in the city were ordered to self-isolation when feeling sick. Bathing houses were shut. Nurses had to live far on the embankments of the city. Beggars and the poor, potentially infectious people, were ordered to clear the streets or to leave the city if possible. The city was ordered from the city's official to calm down, to avoid social life and to stay put and stay healthy, of course. When the individual isn't accessing the material city any longer as he or she was used to, all these places and spaces of interactions change. They change to a non-accessible notion of a static city to a permitted space of regulated mobility. Valencia was the capital city of the Kingdom of Valencia, with a thriving In some instances, urban populations behaved in quite similar ways. Limits on movement, the special challenges to poor and homeless the stresses on health institutions, for instance. 
the threshold between public space and the home has become more pronounced, as the transmission of contagion can be prevented by hard walls. In the past, plague sufferers were confined to their homes, their doorways were marked by public health officials. Today, we are confined to our homes, above all, for personal safety. In the past, processions animated the streets as people sought divine protection. Today, we do this from liminal spaces on the edges of our homes, balconies, windows, front gardens, have become the platforms from which we participate in moving rituals of community, clapping, singing, reciting poetry and so on. As countries contemplate loosening lockdown, concerns are turning to what personal freedoms may be threatened by contact tracing apps. In the past, certificates were required for free movement, precursors at the passports. Needless to say, passports arrived and we still use them. Okay. Okay, that sounded a bit rude, but I decided to cut off the Valencia case study, but I just want to make the video a bit shorter and without asking Isabella to cut every two minutes. Um, yeah, well, in a sense, um, this short film was made during the, the, the European lockdown in May 2020. And, and of course, this remains a sort of an ongoing situation, and this was just a reflection at a particular moment in time. But the reason uh, why we made this short movie was like a pretty urgent one. Uh, in a sense, um, our founding agency, the founding body, the HERONET, so the humanities in the European research area, kind of encouraged all the, all the funded projects to reflect on the effects of, uh, of the pandemic on our work, and, and in particular on our research topic, which was actually the uses of public spaces. This was obviously a very crucial uh, matter as the central concept uh, uh, of our project was to investigate the agency of public spaces from the past to the present. And uh, this kind of key concept that we used, the idea which was at the base of the project, is basically we argued that despite the kind of digital, digital rhetoric that reiterates the idea that the web of social media, social networks, um, at the new global public space, still people needed to gather together in large urban public spaces. So the pandemic with empty cities, empty streets, empty squares, the ban to large public gatherings and did seriously question it and challenge it, this idea. In particular, my part of the project was to investigate the kind of political agency of public spaces such as streets, squares, markets, or taverns. So we kind of had to answer a series of questions. What happened when urban spaces were emptied? Uh, we were just empty architectural urban spaces, and, and which was the division between private and, and, and public space when our homes became sort of hyper-connected. Uh, uh, semi-public spaces and in a sense and what would be the the future of public spaces so we decided to do in a very uh, as an historian would do and in particular as us historians that we, we do interact a lot with material culture so we adopted a similar methodology to our project as a whole and we decided to focus on a series of, of objects uh, of material culture and their relations to public spaces and it, you have seen a few examples here, like the devotional banner, uh, book of hours, or, or a pamphlet, a proclamation, and etc. Um, yeah, I, I have a series of things that I could say about the uses of public spaces, but I don't know if we can keep it in the conversation, or do you want to? I can say a couple oh, of things. You, about can, you can do what you prefer, Massimo, if you wish. Uh... To, to share that later, it's fine if you prefer to conclude now. Okay, well, no, I think, I mean, in a sense, um, in general, uh, I think the, the idea that we, we came up with is uh, epidemics and pandemics also provided an opportunity to rethink and reorganize the, the way cities were lived in. And all the actions suggest that the Rosa, like mentioned, the, 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 uh, the Renaissance authorities 
had a very strong impact on urban planning. What the example of a construction of a Lazzaretti, but also health consideration were included in the design uh, of public space. Uh, like, for instance, for hygienic and sanitary reasons, streets in urban centers were paved over in the belief that uh, mud or dust would encourage the spread of contagion. For the same reason, open spaces uh, and city streets were made more airy and wider than in the Middle Ages. And in, in a sense, as now, when the pandemic is seen as an opportunity for city planners to redesign urban public spaces, it's like to liberate more space for cyclists or pedestrians in urban historic centers. Um, like in the early modern period, it was also a reorganization of the social uses of public urban spaces, rationalized the activities that took place in many public spaces, for example, putting the shops of a sort of improvised dentists or cheese sellers were put on the margins of the cities and not in the main squares anymore. And finally, uh, then as now, the changes did not involve only public spaces, but also private ones. Uh, just in today's home, which, as I said, sort of became uh, hyper-connected spaces, uh, in the early modern period, attempts were made to redefine their spaces, uh, like using housing began to be designed with a greater division of spaces for, uh, for sleeping and for living, for instance, and so in general, the, the, what the pandemic, the effect of pandemic on our research project was like to reflect even on this particular moment of this urgency, this kind of uh, dramatic situation on the impact also to reorganize the urban space we were lived in. Yep. Sorry for this, it wasn't a very kind of... No, it was very, very precise and very punctual. I think that can help uh, us also to understand to to imagine something that could happen also now. So I now I leave the floor to Yashar, who, who will bring us uh, towards the future. Thank you, Yashar, and thank you, Massimo. Okay, so let, let me uh, then then start. Uh, I'm going to present the, the way uh, we, we, we approach the, the, the COVID-19 crisis in future studies. And so to start with this, I need to talk about what this domain of future studies is, is it still uh, working or not? Because I can see what you see on the screen. We we can see the the. You have my page with the okay. first slide and the second one before. So. Okay. Okay. So let me start by a characterization of future studies. Uh, future studies do essentially two things. The first one is to systematically explore uh, multiple futures. And that's really important to understand that we're exploring a plurality of futures. The goal of future studies is not to predict the future that will get real realized. And we do this by using a number of methods, there are around 30 of them, uh, including creating scenarios uh, of the futures, uh, but also using uh, simulation models, for example, uh, and, and other techniques. Now, I put for you what is called the, the cone uh, of the, the, the futures that shows you the space of the future that we can explore. And that's really important to understand about what we are doing in this, this discipline. The largest space of futures is just possible futures, logically, all logically possible futures. Of course, that's very broad, and that might not be very interesting for us to explore. And the, the, the smallest one is all probable futures. So the, the, the futures that we can estimate uh, in terms of their likelihood very precisely. So when we look at the probable futures, that's when we're doing forecasting. But forecasting is a very small activity for futurists. Most often, what they're concerned with is a broader set of futures which are just plausible futures, futures that we have some reason to believe could happen, but we cannot say how likely they are. And we're also interested in preferable futures, so desirable futures. And in that sense, future studies is important for us and also for uh, us uh, ethicists and philosophers because its goal is both to open up 
uh, the mind to multiple futures, but also to imagine and create desirable futures. So there's a normative aspect to what futurists uh, do uh, as well. Uh, and part of the work is also to get prepared for a multiplicity of futures uh, and, uh, and uh, have policies in place for that. The second uh, object of future studies is uh, what you could call the hermeneutic or critical investigation of our assumptions about the future or futures, uh, of our present and past images of the future, and that's where we meet historians, and also of the norms and power relations that underlie both our assumptions about the future and our images of the future. So I'm going to go uh, a bit more quickly when we get to uh, the, the, the content of what we do with respect to the pandemics. Uh, let's look first at the first aspect of future studies, this anticipation, the ex exploration of possible futures. Uh, and uh, here, the first thing to note is that the pandemic is not at all surprising from our viewpoint because futures, uh, futurists have been working on scenarios of possible pandemics for now a long time. It's been around 20 years that this is done at the national scale and also in international uh, organizations like the, the, the World Health uh, Organization. Uh, you've heard of the disease X uh, that has been talked about for many years. And scenario exercises have been done in those settings constantly uh, uh, imagining exactly the kind of scenario that we finally got and trying to get prepared for this. So one puzzle for us is how come governments did not actually act on the scenario preparedness plans that they, that they already had. And that's kind of mysterious and will require, I think, quite a lot of work in social studies, uh, social sciences, to understand what happened in each country. And maybe we can talk about this later on in our uh, discussion. And just to note one thing, is that one scenario that was done last year in the US, the, the Christmas exercise, uh, actually worked on the possibility of exactly that kind of virus that we got coming from China and uh, moving to the US because of travelers. Uh, now, this uh, the, the, the kind of work that we do in, in future studies with respect to, um, uh, to scenarios was created in the 1950s uh, in, in the US by Herman Kahn. And that method of creating scenarios comes from originally a military context, the context of from the 17th century on of creating uh, war games where you, you try to redo a war uh, and try to, to see different outcomes uh, for uh, that, that war. But in the 50s, what uh, people started to do is scenarios for preparing the people to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to an atomic war. And so these were emergency preparedness scenarios and quickly they got expanded to also working on natural disasters, public health emergencies, uh, et cetera. So the, the method of scenario uh, development is basically very schematically the following one. We look at uh, the problem that we want to identify, for example, could there be pandemics in, in, in the future? We look at the uh, drivers of change, uh, we list them, and we try to see what are the drivers of change that are really uncertain, powerful and uncertain. And we give them different values and build then a matrix that gives us uh, three to six scenarios. We can do much more than that, we can do less, uh, and then try to, 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 to build both those images of the future that we get through those scenarios, but also very importantly, the path that leads from the present to those futures. And that's where we try, that's all the work, the causal work of linking the events and the processes and coming up with a plausible story about what we could get in the future and meanwhile discovering what we don't know about the future and, uh, and then trying to imagine the implications of those futures on things that we, we, we value. Uh, so to give you an example of this, this is a, a, a good example of scenario exercise of this type that was done with the key drivers identified. It can go to globalization and environmental change to demographic change or public health systems. And then uh, uh, we find what are the subcomponents of those systems and we get our uh, scenarios uh, at the end. And these are again, not forecasts at all. Uh, so uh, uh, for 
health issues, specific public health issues, these are usually done in terms of scenario preparedness um, uh, simulations in which uh, act, uh, the, 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 the agents uh, who are responsible for public health at different uh, levels in, in, in states or uh, other organizations uh, are brought together and either they're going to play their own role and say what they would do in such a situation, and it's an evolving situation, uh, or uh, we will ask them to play each other's roles, to just identify how they can work together. And very interestingly, the results usually of those kind of exercises are always the same. First, we discover that there are coordination problems. Uh, it almost never works. There are problems with respect to the resources that the actors uh, have uh, and, uh, and also communication with the public. So interestingly and puzzlingly, these problems have never been addressed. And again, we can talk about this later on to see why this is the case. Um, but basically, the goal of all this is to uh, um, imagine different futures and anticipate a broader uh, set of events, train actors to fulfill their role, and uh, to also empathically experience the effects of their actions on others uh, and to modify emergency-related plans and policies. Now, the second aspect of uh, future studies, the, the kind of hermeneutical side of future studies, is to look at sense-making. And here we can look at people's uh, views uh, about their, their hopes and fears about the future as a mirror of their present conditions. Uh, and so if you look at the, the interpretations of the corona crisis that we got, it goes from all the uh, conspiracy theories that we're familiar with between Gates and uh, uh, 5G, but also uh, concerns or hopes about future technologies, uh, surveillance technologies, but also e-health that you talked about uh, last time. Uh, there are also concerns and hopes about the future of work. Uh, it goes also uh, it, the, the crisis has also brought, brought up all the, the more general hopes that people have or their discontent with the, the world, for example, with globalization, with neoliberalism, uh, but also uh, things that are kind of broader than th this. And one of the, the, the things I'd like to mention uh, more particularly is this interpretation of the crisis as being just a dress rehearsal for the larger crisis that are awaiting us, which are the climate-related ones. And those climate-related ones are going to be also, in part, a uh, public health crisis, but not just that. They're going to be civilizational crisis. And people like uh, Bruno Latour, the, the philosopher and sociologist of science, uh, have argued that it would be a missed opportunity not to think of this crisis on the light of the, uh, in the light of the, the, the climate crisis to uh, to, to, to come. And Lucia told, uh, asked me before we started this that I should try to say a few words about spirituality, which is not my domain, uh, but here's my contribution to spirituality here. Uh, I think there are two ways of reading what Latour says about this, the climate uh, crisis. You know, one of them is just to take it plainly about the, the, the just uh, understanding, realizing what is it that to live in a constant state of crisis, which is what we will get with climate change and multiple crises. But the other one is I think that he has a kind of a figural interpretation of, uh, of, um, uh, of events where, uh, uh, like in, in, in the, the interpretation of the Bible, you have some events that, uh, that, that figure that, uh, that represents, uh, signify not only themselves, but also other events. And I think that's the, 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 the kind of more uh, spiritual aspect of this, where now everything is seen from the standpoint of this larger problem that looms large for us. And actually, Latou even talks about Gaia as uh, uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, goddess uh, that, that uh, we, are, we, we need to have a different relationship with her, basically. Uh, so uh, that's the, the this side of the, the future studies. Now I'd like to say a few words about the, a few uh, study, some studies that we do with my colleagues uh, at the University of Twente, but also with uh, Lucia, who's a member of our group. We're doing three studies about 
um, uh, how ordinary people uh, uh, think about a post-corona world. And uh, we started this when the, the pandemic started uh, with this, this light motive that we heard everywhere, which was the world will never be the same again. So in what sense is the world not being going to be the same again? And it seemed that at least at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this moment of disruption of what was usually going on and with a lot of hope invested in it and fear. So we wanted to explore those images of the future that people had. And to do this, we did our three studies. I'm gonna talk just about the first and the third one. So the first one is the letters from a post-corona future. Uh, and we have a little video for that. So I'm trying to make it work. Let's hope that it's... Uh, Let's do a... Let's see. I think uh, maybe let me check. Yeah, sure. I don't know if maybe it was too much. And the system. Let us try to reach a share. Just Suppose you can design the future to come. Imagine yourself sitting in a time machine, which brings you to a time when Corona is over. Open your eyes. Where are you? And when? What do you see? And feel? What does your preferred post-corona future look like? This is what we asked participants in our study. Some think the post-corona future should be made of small connections and a simple life. I think uh, Yashar left uh, uh, the meeting, but uh, he will be back. So. I don't know if we can. Sorry. If you want, I can uh, share the video. I think it's uh, Letters from the Future. Correct? Yes. Okay. That's correct. Thank you. Okay. So we await for him looking at the video. Thank you, Isabella. Sorry. Maybe it's uh, harder than we think. It's not so simple. Because we have Microsoft and Google and they
I know that in my future I need to become more used to technology, that for sure. <laughs> but Isabella is super well trained. So and we hope Yashar can be back soon. So let's see. I think Yashar is already in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, yes. Mm, okay. If we... Okay. Okay. Mind game. Suppose you can design the future to come. Imagine yourself sitting in a time machine, which brings you to a time when Corona is over. Open your eyes. Where are you and when? What do you see and feel? What does your preferred post-Corona future look like? This is what we asked participants in our study. Some think the post-Corona future should be made of small, thriving communities mostly built on the importance of human connections and a simple life. Others think of a high-tech society in which surveillance technologies increase the feeling of safety, although some people may feel less free. Or should we have a world in which we created a sustainable economy, respectful of nature and providing equal opportunities for everyone? When comparing countries, we see socio-economic inequalities, degrees of digitalization, and prior experience with socio-economic crisis impact the way people envision the future after corona. However, more than the differences, the commonalities stand out. Whether from the Netherlands, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Italy, the UK, the US, Ecuador or Mexico, most of the participants hope to see more awareness of what matters in life as a result of the pandemic. What does your preferred post-corona future look like? And how can we make that future a reality? Interested in our research? Visit our website. So I, I apologize for the technical problems. My, my computer just just uh, stopped working altogether at some point. <laughs> so um, I think I've taken a lot a lot of time already. So maybe I should stop uh, here the the presentation, and then we can talk about the uh, if you want to, the other study that we're doing, which is about uh, post corona related uh, uh, moral dilemmas. So thank you, Yashar, for for this uh, overview on future studies and uh, work done since now. Uh, now I leave the floor to Michele uh, for, for the first part of the discussion. Thank you, Michele. And thank you, Yashar. Okay, th thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lucia, for having invited me to discuss this uh, very rich and stimulating contributions of our colleagues uh, Rosa Massimo and Yashar uh, to combine uh, an historical perspective with uh, 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 the future is not easy but uh, I will try to make some comments and uh, and uh, ask some, some questions. Uh, uh, the first uh, uh, point uh, is uh, a methodological one, and I will, would like to say and to emphasize uh, what Rosa said about the importance of an historical analysis uh, of uh, other situations of pandemics or emergencies uh, similar to what we have experienced uh, recently with the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, I think that this uh, gives us uh, a much more realistic uh, approach than uh, the, the big emphasis on the uh, extraordinary experience uh, that we are facing with uh, 
because looking at uh, the history of the past, uh, we can uh, realize uh, how huge uh, were the challenges in the past uh, um, uh, in, in case of uh, um, pandemics or, or other plagues or diseases of this sort. And in spite of the big tragedy of the coronavirus, uh, in comparison with the past, uh, I, I would say that uh, the, this has nothing to do in terms of uh, number of people dead uh, or uh, even uh, economic crisis effects and so on. So mm, I totally agree with what Rosa said about uh, the, the lesson of uh, humility that we can gain from uh, the historical analysis. Uh, having said that, uh, that uh, I, I would like to ask uh, to Rosa and maybe also to Massimo, uh, you have, uh, in, in considering the case of Venice, uh, which is uh, incredibly in interesting and, and rich of, of uh, of knowledge for all of us, and I really uh, would like to thank you because uh, I, I, um, in, in history of political thought and political institution, uh, everybody agrees um, on the fact uh, that the, the Republic of Venice uh, was a real big example of how modern institutions uh, have to be Build in the modern administration, and the case of pandemic is an excellent example. Uh, we 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 suffer some time from this kind of xenophilia, especially in Italy. But uh, when 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 scholars uh, uh, remind all of us uh, the, the the great model of the Republic of Venice, I I, I totally agree, and I feel that uh, the this was really. An incredible example. If you read, for example, Montesquieu or other scholars uh, during the modern age, uh, all of them, all of them uh, were great admirers of, of Venice and uh, of the its institution. My question is related on uh, about individual freedom. Uh, you stressed, uh, and Massimo also stressed, the importance of. Uh, uh, the, 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 the public debate, if I correctly understood at that time, was uh, about security issues on one side and uh, economic interest of the other side. And my question is, uh, in the, the respect of individual freedom was also an issue or, 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 or not so much. Uh, I, I, of course, uh, the situation in the Republic of Venice in terms of the human rights of, of I mean, individual freedom in, in a contemporary uh, sense is completely different from what we have constitutionalized in our, in our um, assets. Uh, but uh, uh, Venice uh, had a strong tradition also in terms of uh, uh, freedom of conscience, uh, religious freedom, individual freedom, and so on. So my question is, uh, is there anything that uh, uh, we can read uh, from that uh, debate about, about the importance of respecting not only economic interest, uh, but also individual individual freedom? And, and this is my, my, my first question. For example, you mentioned the question of, of the permissions and uh, documents and passports uh, in uh, in uh, in the tradition of natural law uh, until uh, the 19th century uh, there was a lot of criticism against uh, uh, the imposition of passport uh, because this was considered a measure uh, typical of the authoritarian states uh, against the individual freedom of every human being uh, to circulate all over the world. And so what we consider uh, something uh, uh, normal for our life, uh, that is a passport uh, for, for many centuries, uh, even for not, not only from uh, I mean the anarchic movement, or, but even from very liberal and conservative representative of the natural law, uh, was considered an, an, an abuse by the the the, the public authority. Uh, my second question is related to the 
urban space uh, and the transformation of the public sphere during the pandemics. Uh, it, it, uh, I'm not an historian and I, I, I don't know very well the history of, of plagues and so on, but I can understand uh, that uh, also at that time uh, there was uh, uh, a kind of alternative uh, between the life in the cities, which was much more dangerous, and on the other side, uh, the, the live in the countryside. Hmm? Uh, for example, if you, if you read the novels of Boccaccio, this is typical of the situation of the plague. They uh, uh, go out of the city and, and they when uh, and they they go to to the villas and 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 to the countryside which is much much more safe and this is something very similar to our situation even in what yashar said if we have to give a picture of our desired uh, future uh, many people uh, look at uh, the future as made by small communities uh, in a beautiful environment in the countryside uh, uh, working for uh, remote and, and so on. But after all these difficulties, uh, the urban model hmm, uh, was victorious hmm, because uh, cities became bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Hmm? And so in spite of all the difficulties of pandemics, of living together, hmm, this kind of incredible hmm, invention of uh, humanity hmm, was not def defeated. So, uh, my second point uh, is, uh, uh, and you and you gave us uh, some some examples and very inspiring of how the the pandemics uh, innovated hmm? the, the 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 urban space and uh, the the living together in cities. But maybe you can say something more about this alternative between um, cities, city life, and uh, countryside life. Uh, and also about the transformation of the public sphere. Because certainly the public sphere is an invention of the city, uh, typical in the ancient Greece. The Agora is the place where the public sphere was created. And so when the public sphere, when the public uh, space, when the squares uh, are not uh, viable for 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 safety or security reason. Uh, what happened to the public sphere? And this is a big question also for our contemporary democracy. Uh, we we have a lot of alternatives uh, on the table, the digitalization of democracy and so on. But I'm not sure that we are uh, fully aware of the. Uh, of the constitutive relationship between uh, the, the, the physical experience of being together in the square and uh, uh, the building of the public sphere in the Western tradition. And, and this was my second point. And my third point is for Yashar. Uh, uh, well, I, I have a lot of questions uh, <laughs> related to the epistemological dimension of future studies, as you can imagine, as a philosopher, uh, uh, there's a lot uh, to 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 analyze, and to uh, I would like really very much to understand much better the the difference between future studies and uh, uh, foresight, prediction, anticipatory decision, and all the other. Uh, uh, in any case, uh, uh, I, I would say that uh, from my point of view as a political philosopher, uh, the foundation of modern political philosophy and modern political science has a lot to do hmm, with, uh, the, with the perspective uh, related to the future. Hmm? Uh, Machiavelli, for example, is is a, is a clear example. Uh, the 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 wise statesman is the one who is able to have a perspective on the future to anticipate what can happen in terms of uh, uh, danger, risks, war, and possible scenarios. And uh, on the other hand. Uh, the, the contractualistic uh, theory, for example, Hobbes uh, is a clear example of uh, a kind of theory in which uh, the future plays a very important role. 
um, we we do need to have the uh, the pressure of uh, a, an ugly past for being active in transforming our present situation, but the pressure of uh, of an ugly past or present is not sufficient. We do need hope in order to create a, a different situation, which is, in Hobbesian term, the civil state, the community, the political life. Mm. Uh, but my question for you, Yashar, is, uh, well, mm, where can we find the energies for imagining this future? Mm. Science? religion, utopia, mm, what else? I think that this is, <laughs> this is a, good, a good question for the future studies because the simple uh, sight into the future can be very depressing, especially for the young generation uh, who are perceiving the climate change and all these big challenges that they have. Um, and so uh, if, if we need a, a positive approach uh, for the future, maybe we need uh, some elements uh, which are not simply the uh, realistic observation of the present or the uh, studying of history or so. I would like very much to hear your opinion on that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michele. We have questions to for for more than half an hour, I think. But <laughs> now I leave uh, the floor back to to our speakers. Please take please take the order you prefer in answering to. Yeah, should I go on the first? Well, I'll leave it at Venice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so thank you, Michele, for the really interesting comments. And I'll try and uh, bring together some ideas quickly. I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously, I think Venice is a really fascinating example for all kinds of reasons. Um, but I think also for, you know, it's been studied from the point of view of history of Republican government and various things. But I think it's also obviously really interesting from the point of view of responses to um, to crises, not just pandemic, but also in the, the, the battle with the environment. I think we have a lot to learn from Venice in terms of the way that um, the government over time sort of, I mean, it's a continual battle for survival really to keep a city going in the, in the Venetian lagoon, obviously more so than ever. Um, but how that relates to individual freedom, I mean, so I'm a historian of, I guess, kind of everyday life and ordinary people rather than history of ideas and my sense is that it, it's individual freedom it's just that most people didn't think that way at this time in this place and that um that you know in a place like venice maybe more than others because of the kind of challenges of of surviving in a place like that there was a kind of pretty uh straight you know exchange between people being willing to give up certain kinds of individual freedoms for the good of the community and the you know the ability to sort of just survive and and be allowed to work and have food and you know all the kind of basic needs of life and that there weren't that many people really articulating these kind of battles and struggles that i was talking about in terms of managing a pandemic in terms of compromising individual freedoms or not I think what was more important in that kind of context are issues of sort of class and ethnicity and religion and gender and how they affect how, how much kind of freedom or power individual people have to cope with this kind of situation. So, you know, to relate it to the points you're making after, I mean, a lot of the wealthy people of Venice who are also members of the ruling class making the rules about people telling them not to move are also sometimes going off to their villas, <laughs> you know, as now and letting the poor, you know, live in crowded conditions in the city and sort of bear the brunt of um, pandemic. So obviously a really important determinant is just how much money and power you have to enact change. And obviously 
again as now, um, the people who also suffer very badly in these kind of situations are the, the sort of marginal people of the kind, um, I think Massimo mentioned it too, but the, you know, the expulsion of, of beggars and of foreign, some foreign minorities and religious minorities like the Jews, for example, um, who tend to be the ones whose freedoms are most easily and compromised. Um, but saying that there is a kind of, I am a bit aware of the, some of the debates about the freedom of movement that are uh, taking place in this period because, I, as I said, I mean, my research came more from the point of view of the history of migration and mobility rather than the history of medicine. And, um, you know, there are debates going on, for example, in the context of the expansion into the new, the new world of the Spanish, you know, about whether that's a legitimate sort of legal and moral uh, movement of people onto the lands of other people, you know. So there, there is, but again, it's sort of, to, I think, usually couch more in terms of individual, uh, the, the movement of groups or races or countries to be able to move rather than the, the, the freedom of individuals to be able to move or not move. Um, but there is a very important, there's an interesting recent book um, which looks at some of these debates by a scholar called Lucas Schultz called Borders and the Freedom of Movement, which looks at the early modern Holy Roman Empire. So I would refer anyone to that if they're interested to look more at some of these kind of academic debates about some of these questions in the period. Um, all right, I might pass on to Massimo then to see if he's got something else to say about that. Well, about the transgression and just as a footnote, we, yeah, because both Rose and I, we tend to study more like the like lower social classes, uh, the ordinary people, but they don't leave much traces of their, I mean, they don't leave writings, for instance, in most of the cases. Uh, so the reaction that, that we can find uh, uh, these people to like the imposition of authorities like in terms of movement etc we find that usually in the regulation of authorities themselves like there's an incredible production like in i remember in milan in all the cities affected by the plague um, uh, of, of bandy proclamations and, and that kind of regulation which were actually read aloud in public etc and i remember uh, beautiful one um, uh, regarding gatherings of kids and women in the streets. Uh, so that's a kind of indications and then this production, it goes on and on in, the, in times of plague. So it, it's an indication then um, child and, 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 and women in particular were actually uh, not obeying uh, the, the restriction of actually moving to houses of other people and were gathering in the streets, uh, etc. So there was a tiny indication that obviously these rules were made, but uh, taken. Um, yeah, there were people that like going against the rules. Um, no, about the question of the, of the public sphere, that's, a, that's actually, it, it is really the question. Um, sorry, no, another footnote about the, the life in the countryside. It's also the, obviously epidemics acted as sort of trigger of social inequality because, yes, yeah, as Rosa mentioned, uh, this social and economic divide uh, as nowadays probably. It is clearly um, in times of crisis, it's particularly evident because people like rich merchants and patrician can move outside of the cities and live in the countryside. Uh, or in the villa, in the Collina di Fiesole, in the case of the Camo. Uh, um, whether the like the ordinary people they're living like in not healthy houses, in packed, crowded uh, neighborhood in the city. Um, but still, there is a on a on a more intellectual level, there is a sense of of of, of uh, yeah. Of, I would say that public health really engages with urban planning quite a lot in this period. So, in a sense, designing uh, more healthy and um, rational cities, even from this point of view, which is a debate. I, I got this article from Yasha, uh, and really all the questions were highlighted about the COVID, about the planning of new kind of streets, etc. Really resounded some of the debates that emerged in the 16th century by architects, urban planners over time. Um, 
what, what happens to the public sphere uh, in a state of emergency? That's really, it is really an interesting question because I'm also not an historian of medicine, um, um, but I'm a social and cultural historian of media and communication. So I did um, address, uh, even when I was reflecting on, on the epidemics and, uh, and this article we wrote with Rosa and the conversation we had at that time, they were mainly coming from our expertise, which is the, the history of media, communication, of, so, of social history. Um, and I did in the past some work uh, trying to historicize the concept of, the pub, of, of Abermas and public sphere and to adapt it, uh, basically arguing that the public discourse was fooled not only by writings, uh, by print, etc., but also by public gatherings, social interaction, uh, by orality, etc. So it is when all these channels of communication they stopped, in a sense, they do stop this kind of uh, ephemera or evanescent form of public sphere that we work on, so the more ordinary people. Um, and, uh, and the other issue that comes into play is the control of the media and, and, and the communication, like namely the new media like print, which is obviously uh, the new media of the 16th century, which is used in time of pandemics to um, publicize also not just the, um, the reg regulation by the authorities, but also um, it is the new media that, that kind of fits into the into this public discourse. So yeah, I don't have actually, I don't have an answer to what if the epidemics uh, have, uh, have really changed the, the way that the, the, the early modern period kind of um, um, faced the public sphere because it, it, in a sense, epidemics and pandemics were such an endemic uh, phenomenon at that time. Uh, but he, yeah, it was dramatic, obviously. It, change it completely the condition of life um, but yeah but it was such an endemic phenomenon that in a sense um, it's difficult even to trace in a direct line of a connection um, so it is a pretty good question but i don't i'm afraid i don't have a, such a, a great answer to it but it's it is i mean in a sense it's part of our yeah one of the argument we think about and work on Okay, I'll let you share. Okay, yeah, thank you, Michele. I think that I, we have one minute uh, to, 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 to answer that, mm -hmm. unless we can stay a bit longer. No, we can. We can stay longer, a little we longer. Can. Okay, so that's good. Um, yeah, th th these are really deep and, and uh, great questions. So let me give you some thoughts about this. Uh, Maybe one way to, to, to put this is to think of this in terms of uh, regimes of historicity, as François uh, Arthur, the historian, uh, mentioned this. So the idea what you're mentioning about uh, Machiavelli and also Hobbes is this idea that during the modern period, with the, 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 the emergence of modernity, a certain configuration of the relationship between past, present, and future uh, was built. And it was a relationship built towards the future, uh, which was guiding us and an open future that human beings can build, especially political power can decide and, and can, can build. And so that's why anticipation is needed in, in that context to, to do that. But there's this faith that we can actually make the future. Uh, we have a say in that. And so what uh, Francois Ardoc argues is that towards the mid 20th century, this configuration of our relationship to temporality has changed. And that what emerged then is a form of presentism where uh, uh, the, 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 the fate in a, in a hopeful future uh, started disappearing. And so what we had is a kind of extended present. Uh, and, and you can see this politically translated into the kind of managerial state that we get. And so I'm in the Netherlands and we're typically in a very managerial state where our, the head of our uh, government, uh, Mark Rutte, actually uh, is, pride, uh, is proud that he, doesn't, he, he has no vision whatsoever of the future. He says, I'm just a manager, I'm just doing this. 
And, and, and it seems that now we are in a new configuration in which we have to think about the future again. And this is brought back to us by climate change and those major transformations that are happening. And I think that you're right. The main, main, our main problem is now how can we regain some kind of hope while avoiding, I think, the, 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 the problems with the uh, 20th century or uh, uh, 19th century ideolo uh, ideologies uh, that, that, that build totalitarian uh, utopias that we want to, to avoid and we no longer believe in, 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 in that. And what I would say is that, I mean, this problem is the major problem on which I, I work. So I, uh, I totally, I don't have a, uh, maybe a very good answer to that, but I think that avoiding catastrophe cannot be the only objective that we have. This does not give you sufficient hope. We need something much more positive. And so what I would view would be some form of incompletely realized utopias or ideals that fall short, fall short of being full-fledged utopias uh, that uh, in order to flourish, those kind of utopias have to be universally adopted. And this is what is maybe not even desirable. Uh, so um, I, I think that's, that's the kind of predicament in which we are and the sources of hope can be can come from many uh, many different pr social practices, whether it's science or religion or philosophy or other sources as well. Uh, but what we can see also in the letters from the future uh, that we read is that uh, people tend to fall back into very traditional narratives of returning to small communities, which are a, a trope uh, in, in utopian uh, uh, narratives that we're familiar with. And that's what we find there. And what's interesting is that this idea of returning to small utopian communities in the countryside is somewhat approached uncritically by the authors of those letters that we, we got in the sense that they do not think of this uh, um, for example, with respect to the rest of the world, to developing countries, for example, they're really centered around their own lives and they don't provide any kind of explanation usually of how you get people to like massively return to the countryside. So are, they, they have this picture of ruralization, but without telling us a story of how this is possible, except like one of the authors who actually had a precise political view of how this should happen, which is that the state should not force you to do that, but should strongly encourage you to do it. Um, but that, that's, that, yes, that, that's, I think, you know, what's interesting about the, this kind of methodology where we, act, we ask people to also think about the path that leads from the present to the future that they desire to see whether we're critical enough of the paths that lead us, lead us to that and whether the futures we desire, we desire are both feasible and really desirable. Thank you, Yeshar. Okay. If there are, so I don't know if there are any other exchanges, we have uh, some more time. Well, I, I had a question actually for Massimo and, and uh, Rosa. Um, so in, in the, the period you're working on, uh, how would you describe changes in restrictions during plague periods? So how often did the restrictions, quarantine, et cetera, change? Uh, would they be like measures, would they be relaxed on a kind of like weekly or monthly basis, or how did this work? My, uh, oh, well, yeah. Uh, I mean, so just to put the broader context a bit more clearly, and Massimo mentioned this, but, I, I, you know, I, we probably didn't mention this clearly enough, which is, you know, that after the, so after the Black Death in the middle of the 14th century, for about a century and a half, plague is returning every kind of five, ten years. I mean, 
So it's very frequent and, and very, I think that's one of the problems. It's difficult to look at a future, you know, when you're living, you're just sort of surviving through those. But then it, from the 16th century, it does become a bit more intermittent. And that's when these sort of also these more sophisticated mechanisms that Massimo was talking about, also the printed notices, you know, trying to regulate activity, the printed kind of documents, the registration of foreigners, you know, coming into cities and going out and all of this stuff starts happening also, which is also related to this. Um, I think it's pretty quick. I mean, again, if you look at sources like these bandi, which Massimo mentioned from Milan, which survive, and unfortunately they're the kind of things that they don't tend to survive, you know, often they don't survive, but if, when they do, they can give you a kind of quite day-to-day -day sense of how things were. And um, they'll be continuously, you know, updating things about, as Massa was saying, you know, saying, yes, by the way, we said you're not allowed to leave your homes. We also meant, you know, you know, this, these kind of people are, you're definitely not allowed to leave for that reason, kind of continuously updating things and reiterating things. Um, so I would say, on a, you know, in some cases on a pretty day-to-day -day level and a bit like, I mean, in the cases of the two big plagues that we've mentioned, the one in the 1570s and the one in the 1630s, a bit like what I hope we're living through now, they kind of went for a couple of years and then they fizzled out and, and you know, obviously a much greater loss of life. But um, so I think there was quite a kind of constant updating of, of, you know, banning travel from a certain place and then relaxing. I mean, obviously not quite at the speed with which we're used to now because it took length longer for information to travel and just to communicate with the public. But on the other hand, you know, both Massimo and I are interested in this sort of issue of communication between governments and people living in these cities. And, you know, they're, they're small enough that you could get messages out, you know, pretty quickly. On a, on a very kind of frequent basis. They already had well-established mechanisms for communicating laws and things to the public on a daily basis. So um, I don't know exactly what to say in terms of, but I would, you know, quite short amounts of time between these changes of policy, I would say. I don't know, Massimo, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, no, I mean, in the, the analogies with the president are pretty striking because, yeah, I don't know if it were weekly updates, etc., but like, the, like in this kind of proclamation where I don't know, they're banning a, uh, like a community or like a city, uh, let's say people from Milan, Bergamo and Brescia cannot enter into the state of Florence and then the week after they added another city, but also Bologna, so but even physically, uh, yeah, they kind of remanded it or denounced a Presidente del Consiglio in the last... Um, yeah, so adding, moving one city in, out, etc. Obviously, it had a quite huge economic and financial implications, this adding a community, a city or a state to this list. And, and that's why also the control of the, of the public sphere of information and the communication was, uh, in time of pandemic, quite important because the spread of fake news or manipulating information was also another issue which was related to the communication of this kind of ban to cities or communities so um, kind of hiding the spread of disease in a certain place as long as you can was kind of uh, one of the classic attempts of the city or the government to protect the economy the, the traffic of goods etc and on the other hand, spreading the fake news of the spread of a disease in another kind of um, in another city, which was maybe um, uh, yeah. So the kind of issues were pretty common at that time. Again, striking analogy were present. It's obvious. Um, Very strong. But... What, what was the process for making decisions on restrictions? Who was involved in those? Well, but they had like, um, the, yeah, I don't want to actually to, to I mean, they're not, anal analogies are so striking, but if, uh, yeah, you have to kind of be careful not to exaggerate the, the attempt because, but they have these kind of commissioni commissions, including doctors, uh, more or less official doctors. And, but in Venice, what was the, what was the, 
Um, yeah, well, I mean, I was sort of thinking about that in relation to, I mean, before this Yasha, you raised that question of how people in this period looked ahead to the future, post-pandemic futures. And the examples I could think of from my own work were exactly these kind of debates that went on on a day-to-day -day level at a time like, you know, in the height, height of these plagues where you'd have, in the case of Venice, the, these per, this permanent public health office which had been established in the late 15th century, which was, you know, members of the patrician government on a rotating basis, um, debating with other members of the government that would be saying, no, we can't close down trade from Milan, <laughs> you know, we've got it, are we going to cripple the economy? And then you've got, you know, Padova, Padua, which is a subject city of Venice, which is saying you can't block off, you know. So this, there's sort of all of these different political actors involved in these debates. They're calling in experts and doctors from the university to kind of advise who are unfortunately in this period often just spectacularly wrong. <laughs> and it actually seems to be quite often the pub, these public health officials who have kind of tried to kind of manage these problems over a longer period of time rather than having, let's say, maybe slightly more ideological ideas about what causes disease and how you should stop it, um, that, that were kind of more correct when we look back about what they needed to do in order to stop. But they were, you know, always debating between different factions of, of these different ruling classes about, you know, what, what needed to be done and what should be done. So in the case of Venice, that's all going in, mostly going on within the different parts of this Republican government because it's quite a big ruling class. In another city like Milan, which is one of the other cities that was very a big leader in the, you know, in the development of some of these mechanisms, it was, a, it was a duchy, so it would have been a slightly different kind of political arrangement. But um, again, you know, very striking uh, parallels with the kind of debates we've seen recently. If I, if I may, I have also a, a small, ob little observation to, to do and, and uh, eventually a remark. So the observation is that it's true that there is a tendency of thinking we, we need the, to rebuild the communities and uh, for some aspects, most of all in a time of uh, uh, still relevant restrictions, we have the idea that small communities can work better, but it is just because we are still uh, moving out, uh, we hope, from the restriction experience in the, in the last uh, year and uh, in, in the last months. But I, I was thinking, I don't think it is really possible to to consider we will rebuild uh, small utopical or mythical communities because there is this tension uh, between the local and the global that is on and that uh, cannot, I think, be stopped. It will be changed most probably, but by the situation, by the outbreak uh, we are living and we are facing, but it, it cannot be stopped. And for some aspect that can also change when we project the idea or imagine for the future communities. For sure, the local dimension right now seems to be prevalent and dominant on the global one, uh, compared to our past, uh, all our past experiences. But uh, there is a, a tension or dynamics that cannot be cancelled, I think. This dynamic uh, between a, a stronger global dimension, uh, we are we are all living and experiencing, and, uh, and the local level or the local life that remains local also. Uh, it was local also before the pandemic. So, so I, I imagine new communities, but that uh, should uh, deal with this uh, double dimension of uh, something strictly local and something that uh, uh, that remains uh, uh, global. And then the second observation, then I await for your observations because you are more experienced than me on the global level and on the, on the local uh, uh, history. Uh, is a very simple question that I have uh, always in my mind and a little bit in my heart too. And it is, is there any role for narrative uh, and any contribution narratives uh, can bring? Because I think all of you are working a lot uh, with narratives and uh, both uh, for historical studies and for the future studies. 
uh, I use them to approach the healthcare field, but I think they can be relevant also to to rebuild something when Michele asked uh, where can we find the energies. I think that sharing narratives can be a, a first step. It's not the only one, it's just a beginning, but it's something that means uh, sharing experiences and all the also emotions and feelings and thoughts uh, that uh, uh, this situation uh, caused in each uh, of us and in, in all of us. So, give you back the... Who would like to go? So, sh should I say something about this? Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. The, 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 these are really good, good, good questions and comments. Uh, so, in the letters that we've read actually together, Lucia, uh, you you may remember that in some of the letters that are in favor of uh, local communities, local sovereign communities, we have some comments about how this squares with globalization, and their idea is actually to use technology to uh, connect all those communities. And so, the way they see things is that the first level for solving your problems is the level of your small community, but then your community is networked with other communities. And then you harness the, the knowledge and the ideas of the entire worldwide network of communities to solve problems that you cannot solve yourself. So it's, it's something that we find in some of the letters, uh, but in most of the, 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 the letters, I think we did not find exactly such a story. In, in some of the letters, we, we, we really saw the tension that it's a kind of unresolved tension between the local and the, and the global. Um, uh, and in the, so, so some other projects that I'm working on, I'm working on food sovereignty, the food sovereignty movement, which is this agrarian movement worldwide that's in favor of uh, uh, small localized uh, production and political control, local uh, control over small scale uh, uh, agri-food systems. Uh, so that's a political project, uh, a utopian political project. And so they have trouble really dealing with this problem of scale because the question is at what scale should you realize those communities, right? Especially like for food production and uh, the, the, the problem is that the claim that they make that you should do it at, at a very low scale, at a scale of micro regions below the national level, it does not seem to be feasible from uh, the, the viewpoint of at least the models that we have about food production and, and, uh, and exchanges, that's just not viable. You need much more international exchange than that. Uh, and so I think that, you know, one of the main problems that, that we have now is what's the level of sovereignty that we should uh, want to have? Is it the level of the very local level? Is it the local of larger communities, those micro regions? Or is it more macro regions like Europe? Uh, um, and, uh, and I think that's the question. I have trouble actually discussing this with them because they have very strong ideological positions, basically. Uh, 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 and and uh, so the, the, all the discussions that you know, I'd like to have with them about the plausibility of their f the future that they want um, are, are difficult because they, they, they simply believe that it's feasible. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. There you are. No. No, just about the narratives very quickly. And um, yeah, we as historians, we do work on narratives, obviously. And then um, what mostly as sources for this extraordinary diary of a notary that we have used in the little article is a, um, like a personal but also public reflection on the plague of this notary, 16th century notary in Venice, 
who describes the, the plague in the city would be walking at night um, to collect the last will of the people and he crosses the city. It's a very kind of evocative description of, a, of urban space, but also of the of the of the city which is um in the middle of a of an epidemic um but also the 16th century there is a new kind of editorial genre uh, which comes out which is a sort of how they call the raguagli sulla peste so it's a more like popular literature describing um the um, what what's going on in a more kind of literary and popular uh, term um, so the actual epidemics become a literary gem, um, which is also interesting because it's, yeah, it's probably not just popular in terms of like, popular in terms, it was, it had a wide consumption and a wide public. Um, yeah, I don't know, Rosa, do you have any other thought? Um, no, I guess when you were talking about narrative, I was thinking more in terms of, um, what I was alluding to about, uh, you know, as a as an occupant of the present, looking towards the future, um, the, how we, you know, look back on these historical narratives and what kind of lessons we take from them and what kind of maybe hope a little bit, as I said, you know, we sometimes can draw from them. So I think, um, you know, obviously, again, we have to be really careful about <laughs> not trying to sort of make some narrative about uh you know venice or italy being you know at the 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 best um respondents to the plague but at the, at the same time i think it can be you know when you're living uh through a moment of crisis where you feel like you're in the worst spot of it which as i was saying you know did feel for a little bit in last year in italy um to to sort of look back and and see some of the, the good aspects of that history of that narrative of some kind of success over the long term is is obviously helpful for also looking ahead to the future and seeing past the, the difficult stage that you're in. So I think, you know, even in terms of the the public history aspect of communicating some of these stories to a wider public, um, I think, you know, they are important, which I guess is also what ma motivated Massimo and I to try and write the article and, and some other stuff that we've written and done since. So thank you really much. I think we will have occasion, I hope we will have the occasion and the opportunity to, to move on with, this, uh, with our discussion and confrontation. It was uh, extremely rich for me. Uh, if, Michele, do you wish to, to make a final remark? To no. No more remarks. Uh, <laughs> we are like Special thanks to all of you because uh, I really appreciate it. Your uh, talks and uh, answers uh, were very rich and also very interesting suggestions for further reading. So thank you. Yes, so now I simply... We, we can go to the conclusion. I thank all of you, and especially this time, Rosa, Massimo, Yashar, uh, for coming. I wish to thank uh, a lot all the participants, Michele, who, who lead uh, uh, the, the idea and shared, like to say, his enthusiasm with, uh, uh, with our confused thoughts at the beginning about uh, what we can do and uh, with Jerome B who now is back to Cameroon but he was involved in, in thinking of this series and uh, I thank uh, our director Marco Ventura and most of all finally last but not least Isabella who is a really a leader in this uh, webinar series because thanks to her organization, patients, and extremely um, expert support. Uh, uh, she has hallowed us to, to meet and to move on uh, in these uh, months. So I thank all of you. I hope to see you soon again for, uh, for other uh, reflection, other common reflections and, and other initiatives. Uh, so have a very nice uh, evening and uh, Let's hope for a better future. <laughs>